right, this is the beginning of a series of lectures that concern the dinosaurs, the history of the dinosaurs, the systematics of dinosaurs, and everything about dinosaurs. But dinosaurs are not found alive today, so we're not studying the ecological environment for dinosaurs. We find them in rocks. So we're going to have to learn something about geology. So we're going to have a quick study on, on geology this evening just to get us started, learn some of the basic principles of geology, and then we will apply that understanding when it comes to studying the dinosaurs. So let's see if we can, there we go. There are three kinds of rocks. There are rocks that are formed from molten rock, and we call these igneous rocks from the Greek for fire. There are metamorphic rocks, which just means change. That means these rocks were originally some other kind of rocks, but because of the conditions under which they were buried, heat and pressure and solution and dissolution, they have changed from what they were originally. And then there are sedimentary rocks, which are formed by the settling out from solution, either air or water, of particles of rock. These could be minerals or, or it could be pieces of rock. Here are some of the basic features of these different rock types. Igneous rocks, represented here by this piece of granite, form when Molten material deep in the earth cools enough so that it begins to crystallize. When it crystallizes, it goes through a series of transitions as it gets to cooler and cooler temperatures, and different suites of minerals will precipitate out at different temperatures. So sometimes we get a rock at the surface which has very small crystals, and these are igneous rocks but we would call that probably something like a basalt or a rhyolite. If it's kept underground and it cools under pressure very slowly over a longer period of time, then it will form large crystals and form a holocrystalline rock in which the spaces in the rock, if there is free quartz in the rock, the spaces will be filled with quartz. Such a rock would be called a granite. And that's what you see here, a, an example of an igneous rock one of several different types. Sedimentary rocks are the result of settling out of either minerals or rock fragments from a solution. And typically, sedimentary rocks show the characteristics of the sedimentary process inside. So you can learn a lot about what was going on when the rock was deposited by looking at the internal structure of sedimentary rocks. Metamorphic rocks are rocks that are much more difficult to decipher, and the history of metamorphic rocks is uh, difficult to unravel because we don't know if they started out as sedimentary rocks, then were almost melted, and then were structurally modified by pressure so that they uh, form something like a gneiss that you see here, or if they form some other lower grade of metamorphic rock. So metamorphic rocks is a study of its own. Sedimentary rocks uh, can be studied by sedimentologists, and that's how they make their living, by interpreting sedimentary rocks. And igneous rocks are studied by igneous petrologists. So you typically, if you ask somebody what they do, and they're a petrologist, they'll tell you, well, I'm an igneous petrologist, or a sedimentary petrologist, or a sedimentologist, or a metamorphic petrologist. And metamorphic petrologists always have the hardest time figuring out what they're doing. <laughs> so depending upon how fast a rock cools, it will produce a different kind, uh, a igneous rock. Depending upon how fast it cools, it will produce a different kind of rock, as I mentioned earlier. For example, if you have a sudden eruption of a magma of, say, a intermediate type to the surface, it will form a glass. And that glass we call obsidian. 
And you've probably seen obsidian. Sometimes people call it Apache Tears, but it's a clear rock. And it's fairly unstable because it was erupted to the surface so fast that it didn't have time to come to equilibrium. So oftentimes, uh, these, these obsidian type rocks will start to degrade with time and will soon be modified by interaction with other minerals in the rock and form uh, various kinds of uh, minerals, usually clay. But if they, are, if they are held underground and the heat and pressure remain, then they will tend to be intrusive rocks that have large crystals and are holocrystalline. And those kinds of rocks, we assume, were, were cooled off down inside the Earth somewhere. So we have intrusive rocks that are cooled inside the Earth. We have extrusive rocks that were erupted to the surface. The ultimate extrusive rock will be an obsidian glass or something like pumice, which is a, a form of glass that was full of air or full of uh, gases. So it formed a foam. And pumice is the stuff that women use to rub the hard-earned calluses off their feet. So for whatever reason women decide to do that, it's uh, done with a, with a volcanic extrusive rock that has come to the surface suddenly, has formed a foam. And that foam then uh, oftentimes is lighter than water and will float. So there are a whole lot of extrusive type rocks. There are a lot of intrusive type rocks that are igneous. Here, for example, is a extrusive rock. This is a kind of basalt. It's called pahoyhoy. It's a Hawaiian word for ropey. It means that it forms these ropey, ropey structures on the surface. And pahoyhoy is very easy to walk on. Uh, the other kind of magma that's produced by eruptive uh, basalt is called a'a. And you can guess why it's called a'a if you see it, because it's got lots of sharp shards at the surface. So as it was erupting, it broke up. It wasn't hot enough or it wasn't fluid enough. It may have had too high a, a silica content, and it became very coarse and harsh at the surface. So people, when they walk on that, they say a'a. Metamorphic rocks, as I said, are those that have changed from the original type of rock they were into something else. They can be sedimentary rocks, igneous rocks, or they could be other metamorphic rocks that are subjected to metamorphism. They, uh, the only criterion that metamorphic rocks have to have is that they did not melt. If they melt, then they become an igneous rock, and they no longer would be categorized as metamorphic rocks. A lot of metamorphic rock form um, in, in what we call subduction zones, places where the crust of the Earth is diving down underneath another crust. Maybe you have a continental crust and an oceanic crust. The oceanic crust is more dense, so when it crashes into the continental crust, it's forced downward, and all the material on its surface is scraped off onto the continent. And uh, that's where we get California and Oregon and Washington and all that stuff. They all came, they were all scraped off the bottom of the ocean. And that's where we got them. So those rocks that are in that zone are subjected to a lot of heat and pressure right in here. And so they tend to be metamorphic rocks. So if you go up, for example, to the Klamath Mountains or some of those mountains in California, you'll find a lot of metamorphic rocks there. And California itself is full of uh, various species of, of metamorphic rocks. Sedimentary rocks are formed from pre-existing rocks, that is sediment, or pieces of once living organisms. For example, you can have rocks that are made out of diatoms, which are little siliceous fossils that are found on the ocean bottom. These rocks are made entire, almost entirely of, of diatom uh, tests the outer, the outer structure of diatoms. And so we would say that is a kind of a sedimentary rock, but it's made up entirely of the uh, fossils of organisms. Or we can have uh, sedimentary rocks that are made up of clay or sand 
or even coarser material like a conglomerate and rocks. These are all sedimentary rocks. Clastic sediments are pieces, clast just means a piece of rock. So clastic sedimentary rocks defines a suite of rocks that are all made from pieces of other kinds of rocks. These can be sand or clay or even boulders. Here are some examples. This is a conglomerate on the left. A conglomerate is a kind of rock made up of diverse sized particles. It's not made just of big particles. Why is that? Okay, if I had a room full of bowling balls, it would, uh, they'd be like boulder-sized clasts. But look at all the room in between those, bo those bowling balls. That's all going to be filled with finer stuff. So conglomerates typically are sandstones that have larger particles in them. Sandstones are, have smaller sized particles. And then siltstones are smaller yet, and shale or claystone is smaller yet. Here is the Wentworth scale for difference between clay and boulders and cobbles and pebbles. So we call sand anything that has a diameter less than two millimeters, which is about that big. So a sand typically is of a size you can see with unaided eye. So you don't have to chew a sandstone to find out that it's sandstone. You can just look at it. But silt, you don't know if it's silt or claystone or even a sandstone. So typically a piece of silt, you're going to want to take a bite. And if it's gritty, if it has grit in it, then it's a siltstone. If it's nice and smooth, then it's a claystone. And finer grades of ice cream, which you had tonight, oftentimes have clay mixed in to make them smooth. So obviously, if clay had grit in it, that wouldn't do much for your ice cream, would it? So the sizes of these particles are less than 1 256th of a millimeter. That's really, really small. And so clay-sized particles are so small that they can't cause any, uh, anything to happen on your teeth when you bite it. And so you take a bite of clay stone, and you say, oh, mm, that's good. That's smooth. They also use clay and paint, by the way, to, to smooth it out and fill it. And uh, those, those, again, are very small particles. However, between 1 16th and 1 256, in this area right here, you can't see the clay. You can't see the sand grains very, very well. But if there's sand in it, then you would say it's a siltstone. So you take a bite of that, and you can feel the grit on your teeth. Your teeth are very, very sensitive to to grit, and so you feel that grit, you know it's a siltstone and not a sandstone. But the tip, the actual measurement is a sixteenth of a millimeter to two millimeters. And then if you have particles larger than two millimeters, up to sixty-four millimeters, that'd be about six centimeters. Uh, that would be pebbles, and six centimeters to uh, twenty-five centimeters, that would be cobbles. Anything over twenty-five centimeters, that's about a foot. Uh, that would be a boulder. So we say we have a boulder conglomerate, a cobble conglomerate, a pebble conglomerate, a sandstone, a siltstone, and a claystone over on this side. Those are the names of those rocks. So it's pretty obvious. There's nothing that's not easy to uh, pick up on that. I will add one more thing, though. A lot of times we lump these together, silt and claystone, and we call it a mudstone. And Oftentimes, as in our quarries, the mudstone we're working in is shaley. So we say it's a shaley mudstone. Shaley just means it has facility. Facility means it splits. So if you see in your quarry, you see that mud, and it looks like it has partings in it, then that would be shale, which is made up typically of mudstone. So I call, without having uh, done a microanalysis of the sediment, I call our, our, the material in our quarries, the vast majority of it, is a shaley mudstone. Any questions? So that's how you categorize clastic sedimentary rocks. There are other kinds of sedimentary rocks that are not clastic, or at least they're not defined as clastic, even though they may be uh, derived by sedimentation of particles. 
the particles are something besides silicate minerals. So we often call these chemical sedimentary rocks. These are things like limestone. Limestone is made of calcium carbonate. That's a chemical. Lime. Calcium carbonate is the stuff that uh, is in the rocks that overlie the quarries very often. The rocks that look like they're solid layers around the Hanson Ranch, the tops of the hoodoos that protect them from erosion, those are the same sand that the hoodoos are made of, but it's been cemented together by calcium carbonate or limestone after the rocks were deposited. So we say that's diagene diagenetic alteration. So during diagenesis, minerals percolate through the rocks and precipitate out and leave behind calcium carbonate. And that calcium carbonate then cements the rocks together. And how could you tell if a rock had calcium carbonate in it? What's that? Put some acid on it. Put some acid on it. You could use vinegar. Uh, vinegar would cause slow evulsion of, of carbon dioxide. Or you can use hydrochloric acid, it's much faster. And you just put a drop of that on the rock and it fizzes. And you know that it's a limestone. So it's a very easy test. Other rocks are made of gypsum. Now we have some gypsum in the quarries, not a great deal. And that's a good thing because gypsum will get inside fossils and then expand and cause them to break. Uh, but gypsum is made of calcium sulfate. Now, where do you normally see calcium sulfate? That's a very familiar chemical. It has a magnesium salt that's used to make tofu and to soak your feet and things like that. That's magnesium sulfate, also called Epsom salts. Uh, calcium sulfate is related to that. Calcium sulfate forms gypsum, and gypsum is what we make most of our houses out of. We press the gypsum because it's very soft. We press it between two layers of paper, and then we put it up for a wall and put paint on it, and it looks like a wall. In reality, it's just a layer of gypsum about half or three quarters of an inch or uh, half or five eighths of an inch thick. So if you're ever caught inside a building, let's say somebody captures you and puts you in a room and they're going to do something to you or kill you, you can kick your way out of the room through the gypsum because it's nothing but paper and soft calcium sulfate. So you never need to be locked into a room in a house, an ordinary house. Now, if you're in a castle, I don't know why you'd be in a castle, but if you're in a castle and it's got walls made of two inch blocks of, two feet blocks of, of granite, then you're probably not going to kick your way out. But uh, it is interesting and it may be life-saving to know that you can kick your way through a wall in most houses. There also are biologic sedimentary rocks. These are rocks made of either the remains of fossils or made of the remains of plants. Animal fossils are the remains of plants. For example, coal. Coal is a rock. It is carbon that has been re reduced from plant material. And the plant material has been altered by heat and pressure and water to make coal. And the coal is a rock. So just pure carbon in the form of coal, which really isn't always pure. It has lots of other things in it. But it's mostly just pure carbon. That's a rock that's made from plant material that's been compressed. And if you go about uh, 30 or 40 miles from here, you come out east of Newcastle, west of Newcastle into one of the largest coal reserves in the world, certainly the best coal reserve in the world. And every day, dozens of trains filled with this coal go zipping off in different directions on the rail systems that are on every side of us. 
off to various places like California and Texas and uh, other places. And that coal is used mostly for generating power. But the deposit is very, very thick. There is enough coal, even though they are taking out thousands of railroad cars a day, there's enough coal there in this, in this deposit to last for another 100 years at the current rate of, of removal. The thing to remember is that 100 years sounds like a lot, long time to you, but 100 years from now, it's not so long. And it doesn't take very long for that 100 years to go by. Here is an example of a biologic sedimentary rock. It has lots of different little things. This is a spicule of a sponge. This is a foraminiferin, foraminiferin there. These are scleractinian, scleras of scleractinian corals. Here's another sponge spicule here. And all of these materials here are made up of fossils. Or at least, or this may be a modern sand or maybe a fossil sand. Let's talk for a minute about the rock cycle, what happens in nature and how it's visualized. Where does sediment come from? Uh, we have a little different view of this because we believe in a catastrophic global process that deposited many of the rocks that we see in just one year's time or thereabouts. But the processes that go on here we know are going on today. Igneous rocks break down. Uh, they interact with the environment with heat and cold and with oxygen and water and they change their composition and become minerals such as feldspar and silica which is gl uh, glass or, or uh, quartz and that, gla that quartz and that feldspar then will weather further to form quartz and clay and the clay will deposit as sediment somewhere it will be washed away and deposited as sediment along with the, the quartz. Then uh, that can be hardened into a rock that becomes a sedimentary rock. That sedimentary rock can be, not necessarily, it can weather also and go back through this cycle again, but it can also be metamorphosed by heat and pressure to form a metamorphic rock such as a slate or a uh, phyllite or some other kind of metamorphic rock. That can then uh, if it gets heated enough, it can melt and become a magma. That magma can then solidify and form an igneous rock, and this whole cycle is going on all the time. All right, let's talk about sedimentary environments. Normally, a geologist would come out here and study these dinosaur bones and the surrounding rocks and try to tell you where those dinosaurs lived. What was it like? Was it a plain? Was it a, a lake? Was it around a river? Was it a desert? Was it a deltaic environment where the water is flowing into an ocean? What kind of an environment did they live in? Well, for one thing, that's making the assumption that they lived here, which from our perspective is an unsafe assumption to make because underneath us here, are thousands of feet of sediment containing fossils that we believe were deposited during the flood. So how could the dinosaurs have lived here before the flood if this is a depositional center where sediments were accumulating over, over that entire period of time? So they must have been washed in here from somewhere outside this environment. Uh, the most likely place is from the west because the Sediments appear to be driven toward the east during the, uh, during the Mesozoic. So that would put it off, say, between here and California somewhere. And California has subducted, the, the plate along the coast of California has subducted underneath the continent. And it's now riding out here underneath the Rocky Mountains somewhere. So it's possible the place where the dinosaurs lived is gone forever, swept down into a subduction zone and lost from sight. And the dinosaurs may have drowned. They would have then bloated and floated and, and moved around at the surface for a while. They may have been transported inland and eventually their remains came to rest somewhere out here. 
We don't know, but that's, that's all speculation. One environment that geologists often cite is a beach environment. Beaches are very active places. There is constant movement of sediment along beaches. As you can see here in this picture, all of these breakwaters that have been built out there, those are not for people to go out and fish on. Those are put there to keep this sand beach from moving on down the coastline. So this sand will tend to be, it looks here like it's, a, it's moving to the, to the uh, left. So this sand would be swept down here and then this would be scoured back and eventually this highway would be washed away and then it would start in on the cliffs. And I mentioned in another lecture that the coastline of California is moving toward Florida at about one foot per year. So the idea of owning coastal property in California is not a very good one. And you can see as you walk along the beachfront homes, many times the people have spent hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars trying to keep their property from moving on down the line. Yes? Didn't that buy cheap beachfront property in like uh, Mississippi, which is worthless for some reason, Great. move to Florida and become valuable? Great idea. In about, uh, about eight million years, it, it would be there. So you'd have to wait a while. <laughs> All right, here's another environment that geologists often cite, a deltaic environment, where a river is emptying into a still body of water, or relatively still body of water, and it builds out a deposit of sediments into that body of water, and that's called a delta. So this is a deltaic environment, and it's a unique environment because it has contact with the body of water all the way around, and it's constantly changing because there is always new material being brought down by the river. Uh, fluvial environment is where you have a river moving across the landscape. Rivers very often do what we call meandering. That means that these big loops that you see here, like this, the river will build those loops when it's moving fast. You might think meandering rivers are moving slowly, but meandering rivers are moving fast, so fast that the water can't keep moving straight, so it gets pushed off to the side, and as it pushes off to the side, it moves around like this and like this, and uh, so you have accumulation of sediments here, and that moves the river farther and farther out. This is called a point bar, you can see why, and this is called a meander, and right here you see what looks like a cutoff and a cutoff can happen during the flood stage and the river can take a shortcut across here and then this loop of the river becomes isolated and it no longer has input of water so it becomes a oxbow lake. An oxbow lake is a place where there used to be a meander in the river and now it's been cut off. So when you look from an airplane down on a meandering river like this you can see all these features spread out on the flat area in front of you. Here is a floodplain, and this is a braided river. Braided rivers are ill-defined. They are fast moving, and they often carry pebble to cobble-sized uh, pieces of gravel. If you remember this story, the talk about uh, Banks Island, Banks Island uh, is the, the place where we were staying out there. We landed on this river in our airplane and got out and uh, did our work here on this river. And that river was very fast moving, very flat, very fast moving, and that causes it to be a braided stream because these streams are moving so fast, they don't always seek the easiest path. They'll go wherever it's convenient to go. This is a lake, lacustrine environment. It's different than an ocean environment. For one thing, it's often uh, non-saline. It may not be salty, it may be fresh water, but it's a lake environment. And that has unique characteristics. Here's an Aeolian environment. Aeolian means sand that's blown by the wind, a wind-blown sand. And although geologists often talk about things as being Aeolian, 
it's very difficult to get an accumulation of eolian material because sand is always moving. It's going somewhere else. And uh, you can get dunes as, as high as 1,000 feet up, but those dunes are constantly changing. And uh, the material is always being recycled every time the wind blows. So eolian environments are very interesting and unique. They're very difficult to define in the fossil record. So then a geologist with, these, with this skill set that we just went through, understanding these various kinds of environments and looking at what kinds of uh, sedimentary processes occur in each of those, they can try to reconstruct for a fossil deposit what kinds of things they think were happening when that fossil deposit accumulated. So you can talk about uh, things like a, uh, a flood. For example, here's, here's an example of a flood where you're having a lot of stuff happening in a very short time. Here you have a deposit left behind by that flood. The bedding plane has been cut because the flooding waters ripped up some of the material below and transported it off. Yes? Could we find the bedding place for the Great Flood? Uh, it wouldn't have been one. It would be many hundreds of thousands of planes. Could we find it? A hundred thousand. One? Anyone. No, anyone. I, there's dozens of them in your quarry. Okay, so here's some examples of conglomerate. On the left is conglomerate. Notice the rounded particles. And the rounded particles, rounded particles. Over here, notice the particles are very angular. Now, what kinds of characteristics would distinguish these two in terms of the environment of deposition? Yeah. Wouldn't uh, the rounded one be deposited in like a fluvial or aquatic landscape? while the angular one would be positive in a non-aquatic plants environment? Okay, that's, that's of course makes sense because we see rounded pebbles and cobbles in streams. Uh, we don't see angular particles for very long anywhere, so angular particles would have had to be buried very quickly from whatever source they came. So oftentimes these angular particles are from a volcano and they, they are ejected from the cone of the volcano, so they haven't had time to round before they get buried. And so we call those a breccia. So this on the left would be a conglomerate, and this on the right would be a breccia. Breccia means broken. That's probably a Swiss word, yes. Breccia is good for well. Yeah, it's associated with faults because oftentimes in faults, there's almost no transport or no transport of the materials. So the fault moves, it breaks up the rocks, and then the rocks may stay there or they may be transported uh, somewhere in the vicinity of the fault. That's true. Okay, here's an example of sandstone. And again, this looks like sand-sized particles. You can see the particles, so it's a sandstone. Here's a siltstone. You don't see any particles, so what do you do? Taste it. That's right. Take a bite. You don't actually have to bite the rock off, just run your tooth over it, and you'll know if it's a siltstone or not. And here's some clay stone. This is shale over here, breaks into, into uh, sheets. Over here is clay stone. This is pretty massive clay stone, so it's not going to, uh, but you could take a bite of that, and it would be very, very smooth in your mouth. And you might say, ew, I would never take a bite of a rock. Well, you've been biting rock all day long. Because every time you open your mouth, you get dust in there, and that dust is the same stuff the rock is. So, so uh, we now talk about radiometric dating. Uh, we'll re review some concepts and talk a little bit about it. Geologic time is is parsed into what we call absolute time and relative time. Absolute time means that we have used a radiometric method to get, get a date. Absolute is a misnomer because there's no such thing as absolute dating. That would imply that we know everything that has to be known about the situation. The rock science is that the 
the top rocks are younger than the ones underneath. You had to deposit the underneath rocks in most cases before you could deposit the other rocks on top. So that's relative time. So I can say these rocks are older than these rocks without inferring any particular time frame for, for that statement. Yes. Is there ever been a time where uh, two sediments, you know, like the, the older one and the younger one, flipped or switched? Uh, lots of them. There is a, a very famous case in Italy where a slab of rock 100 kilometers long, 100 kilometers long, is upside down. And the the explanation is that the rock was still relatively unconsolidated and it started sliding. The whole body of rock started sliding, probably generated by an earthquake, and the toe got caught. And so the, the top of the rock just went right over the top and it kept going. A hundred kilometers, if you can imagine that. There also are places like uh, Beartooth Butte and other places where the rock sequence is out of order because a thrust fault pushed a block of material up over the top of another block of material. So if you have younger rocks here and older rocks here and you push this over the top, or older rocks here and younger rocks here, you push it over the top, you can get older rocks on top of younger ones. And creationists used to use this as an example of the fact that you couldn't believe the fossil record because here is this Beartooth Butte where you have old rocks on top of young rocks, but that's ridiculous. We can explain how they got there, but in fact, it probably requires that it be underwater. Mm. No surprise there. And it really is evidence for a catastrophic origin, and that's consistent with our understanding of Earth history. So we ought to be using it as evidence for a, a catastrophic process rather than trying to make it something that it's not. Here's an ex example. This illustrates the principle of original horizontality and superposition. Superposition means that one layer is above another layer. Original horizontality means that rocks are laid down more or less flat. So if you see rocks that are not horizontal anymore, you would infer that originally they were deposited horizontally and they have been tilted up since that time or something has happened to them since that time. So the principle of original horizontality says rocks were laid down in flat layers. Principle of superposition says that this layer was laid down on top of this layer, was laid down on top of this layer, was laid down on top of this layer, and on top of this layer. So that sequence tells you something about the order in which those sediments accumulated. Is that clear? All right, cross-cutting relationships. Here you see some layers of rock, and here are some cross-cutting rocks. So ask yourself this, which of these layers came first? And you'll have to conclude that this layer, this layer, this layer, this layer were there before any of the rest of it, right? Then what happened next? Like C, was there next? And then what? Dyke B came next, and then Dyke A. Dyke is a intrusion of usually meta, uh, igneous rock. So molten rock was pushed up, squeezed up into these sediments. It split them apart and left behind a layer of igneous rock. All right. Principle of original continuity, if you see layers that are not continuous, you try to move them until they can be continuous. So in this case, you might move this one down until that red layer there is here, the green layer is here, the white layer is here, and so on. That would match up pretty good. So that's how you deal with faults. You assume that if the layers are not continuous, if they stop at a fault, that you should be able to slide them along the fault the fault uh, um, plane, the plane of the fault, you should be able to slide them along that plane until you get them lined up again. And then the law of included fragments, this is, again, all of these rules are very much self-evident. Law of included fragments says if you find fragments of this rock in this layer here, 
Well, dummy, this layer had to come first, right? Otherwise, you couldn't get them up here. So, but that's very valuable. And a lot of times we use that to unravel volcanic rocks because we find the volcanic rocks have subsumed some of the surface rocks they came through. So you'll find these inclusions in igneous rocks that are from the surrounding country rock. And so you can then uh, put together some kind of an order. Yes. Can that be used? that uh, principle of original continuity, can that be used to find where a bone may be? For instance, yeah. like, it's say you're digging in sandstone and the sandstone turns rock hard. Right. Could that be a sign of there being another bone nearby? Or uh, it's conceivable, but not by this principle. Okay. But this principle is used by oil companies all the time because what happens is you see this movement here it's cut off this sandstone layer by default. So if you want to find some oil, what you do is you drill, drill right here down into this layer right here. This is porous. This rock right here is not porous. And so you'll find oil in there. You won't find it over here because this may, uh, this may have a, a way of escape. But here you've got a trap and you're trapping the oil in this layer so you can drill down there and get oil or water out. Yes. Uh -huh. Either one. If they're exotic, they're not part of the material that you're looking at, then they can tell you something about the history of the rocks. So they can be big or they can be little. Unconformity, that's where two layers of rock are in contact and that contact is unconformable. But that means that this layer is flat and maybe this layer is tilted or this layer is tilted and the layer on top is flat. That would be an angular unconformity. We talked about when we were discussing geologic time, we talked about a case where there was an unconformity that looked like it was conformable. So that's called a paraconformity. It appears to be conformable, but we know that 10 to the 35 million years is missing there. Remember that? Remember the story of the Moenkopi and Shinarup, where the two layers are sitting one above another and the contact looks perfectly conformable. It looks just like any other contact between two layers. It's horizontal, uniform, and yet the, the geologists tell us there's a lot of time in between there. But I pointed out to you that the time, 10 to 35 million years, is enough time to erode all of North America down to sea level. So you can't have a layer of rock sitting there for 10 million years without something happening. Either more accumulating or eroding has to be going on. This rock was still soft when the overlying sediment was deposited. So that's an unconformity uh, that is a paraconformity and that probably represents almost no time at all. And uh, here's an example of an unconformity. These, these layers are coming in at a slight angle here. That's an unconformity. And these, these rocks are at a different angle here. Principle of fossil succession. If you assume that evolution is true, if you assume that evolution is true, then the first time you see a fossil, you could say that's the first time that fossil's been on Earth, right? It has evolved and now it's here and it stays around until it disappears. So you say that fossil has a range and that range gives me some information about time and process. If that assumption is wrong, your interpretation can change drastically. And so since I think it's wrong, I think there is no fossil succession, but there's just a burial of different environments so that what the fossil record really represents is a successive burial of different things through time, not the evolution of different things. 
But the evolutionary assumption is that these fossils weren't around anywhere on the Earth until they're there. And once they're there, they should be everywhere after a while. And if they're everywhere, then whenever you find those in the fossil record, you're dealing with the same time as the original discovery. So that's the way uh, uh, stratigraphic uh, studies are done. You look for fossils, you try to identify those fossils, find out where else those fossils are found, and that gives you a range where you can place the layer that you're studying. Is that clear? Okay. Yes. With that um, graph thing, it's definitely it's backwards then, because this is it's showing here how you know this this was the first thing that came up, and then the next and the next, but really it all was there, and then it's just slowly. Yeah. Off. Yeah. We you would assume that in most cases the material was all there. It was just somewhere else besides where you're filling in sediment at the moment. And of course, even in an evolutionary assumption, you assume once you have a particular organism on the Earth that it's going to stay there, uh, and it may disappear from sight, and reappear later on, like the coelacanth fish and things like that. Uh, so you have to have uh, some kind of system where you can hide things for a long period of time. And uh, that's why Darwin referred to the origin of the angiosperms, the flowering plants, is an abominable mystery. Abominable because you have none of them, and then you have, in very short order, all of them. All right, so here's an example of how uh, stratigraphers can use various organisms and their ranges over here. So here's, here's the Paleozoic, Mesozoic, Cenozoic, and these are some of the indicator fossils that are used. So if I find a trilobite that looks like Paradoxites, that's going to be early Cambrian. I know that right away. If you bring me a rock, a rock that has a uh, brachiopod in it, if it's a spiriferid brachiopod, I might assume that it's going to be Paleozoic. Now I'd have to look into which spiriferid brachiopod it was before I could tell you much more than that. Graptolites uh, are in the uh, Ordovician. Uh, these look like sponges. I can't really see what it says. So here's another brachiopod here, another brachiopod here. Then you get up here into the Mesozoic, you're dealing with ammonites. And these ammonites are very distinctive and unique to various parts of the Mesozoic. I don't know how to explain that. It's something that needs explaining how you can get this ordering of the ammonites in the Mesozoic uh, without an evolutionary process. <clears throat> but you know what? There are lots of things I don't know the answer to. That doesn't mean there isn't an answer uh, that's consistent with the Bible story. And so for a scientist not to have all the answers, that's like candy to a baby. Because every answer I don't have is something I can study and try to find out that answer to. If we had all the answers, guess what? Life would be very boring for a scientist. Okay, here's how stratigraphic correlation works. You, you're at this outcrop here, maybe 50 miles away from this outcrop over here. So you're going to try to correlate these. How do you do it? Well, you try to use lithologies, but lithologies change. So you got this yellow layer here. You got the yellow layer here. You've got this shaly layer up here. That matches this layer here. So as a first approximation, you might say, okay, this and this match with that and that. But down here, you've got shale down below it. Over here, you have limestone and then uh, shaley limestone or shaley sandstone down here. And those are different. So then you want to go to your fossils and you see what kind of fossils are in this, what kind of fossils are in this, what kind of fossils are here, what kind of fossils are here, and see if you can correlate them using fossils. Uh, here, for example, you see an outcrop. Uh, here's layer A, B, C, D. Over here you just have A and C and D. How do you know you have A there? Because you have the same brachiopod that you have over here. So you have that brachiopod here, you have it here, you have it here. This has got to be A. You're missing B because here's C right here. 
and then D looks like it carries across just fine. So you can then correlate those two, and what you would just define is that uh, B is not deposited here, or it was deposited and then eroded away. We talked about that when we were talking about uh, sedimentation. All right, now it's your turn. Look at this diagram for a little bit and give me the order in which things happen, including the processes, not just the layers, but the processes. For example, number one, you might think that's the first thing deposited, but what must have happened before anything else? Or what happened before three came in? It had to be folded, so it was tectonically altered before the next layer came on top. Okay, so now give me a description of what happened in this scenario. We'd like to take, okay, Lisa, loud so we can hear. Okay. Okay, good. After it was layer two, not layer, but dash number two is that number two occurred. Okay. The on top of it is layer three, and for some reason they are slanted instead of being horizontal. Okay, so what must have happened after they were deposited? Law of original horizontality. What must have happened? Okay, so it was tilted from its original horizontal position. So that would be after you deposit three. Okay. Okay. It pushed its way up in here. And then you had a period of erosion. And all these layers were leveled off. And then layer five was deposited. So that's how stratigraphers try to figure things out and place things in relative time sequences. But relative time sequences do not have dates on them. So we can't say, without using radiometric dates, we can't really say how long it was between these different processes. But a, a, a standard geologist would tell you that this required so many million years, and this required so many million years. But in reality, it could all have happened relatively quickly. Okay, any other questions? Yeah. Oh, yes. In this type of diagram, uh, would radiometric dating uh, suggest otherwise? Like the certain numbers were not, they were older than? Um, typically, radiometric dating would give you the same kind of ordering that you would get. Of course, the only thing you can date is this and this. The rest of it is not datable by any of the major techniques that are used in radiometric dating. So it would have to be, uh, it would give you this date, which would give you a minimum date for this surface up here. And this one would give you a date for, it had to be put in before this surface was in place. Any other questions? All right. Thank you very much.